I just want to first of all thank you on behalf of myself. I'm Shondell Goldsmith. Um, I'm from the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So on behalf of myself and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, um, I want to welcome you and thank you for coming out and supporting this program. Before I get started, I'd like to thank personally Tahisha Williams, who is our office administrator. Yay. Yes, and Dr. Magda Alianson, who is the director of the Employee Assistance Program. I had a family emergency last week, and they were able to get the posters out and just really help out with getting this um, workshop together. So I just wanted to thank them. And before I turn it over to Ms. Delfont, who is the workshop trainer and facilitator today, I just wanted to briefly say a few words about the Office of Diversity and Inclusion for those of you who are not aware of what we do. I get that question a lot still. So just briefly, um, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion is here to assist and promote equal access and equity for all of our students and staff here on campus, starting from recruitment through promotion, retention, um, and advancement in academic programs for students. We do that in a multitude of ways, one of which is having educational trainings and programs like the one we're having today. Additionally, we partner, hey Adriana, we partner with agencies and offices on campus and off to make sure that our goals of equity and inclusion are being fulfilled. So we work with Student Affairs, Office of Diversity, um, Equity, Research, Education and Research, and as well as Human Resources. Um, lastly, I want to mention that our office is also the office that you can go to if you're having an issue with another student, with another staff member that involves discrimination, harassment, um, where you feel like you're being treated differently or unfairly, our office is the one that would investigate that. Depending on the type of complaint, it could be something that could be handled through mediation where we bring parties together. So I just always like to make sure that our staff members and our students know that the office is there to assist them. Okay, so now I want to just introduce our speaker. Um, so our speaker today comes from CAMBA's Violence Prevention and Intervention Services, VPIS. Uh, CAMBA is a community partner that provides people with resources and opportunity, opportunities. CAMBA provides services that assist with health, housing, and legal issues, just to name a few, and that's really just a few because they help with landlord-tenant, they help with immigration, many issues um, that happen to members of our community. CAMBA, through its violence prevention and intervention services, also provides assistance and resources to victims of violent crimes, including domestic violence and sexual assault. Our speaker today is Ms. Dulce Delfonts. Ms. Delfonts joined CAMBA's Violence Prevention and Intervention Services in 2016. She's a health educator with her primary focus on gender harassment and violence. She has presented numerous workshops and trainings to universities and colleges in Brooklyn, including here at SUNY Downstate, on topics in including sexual assault, intimate partner violence, affirmative consent, and domestic violence. Ms. Delfonts has a bachelor's degree in gender and women's studies and has worked in the field of prevention for since 2013. At this time, please join me in welcoming Ms. Dulce Delfonts. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. Okay, let me try to make sure I stay in place. <laughs> so, like Mrs. Goldsmith said, my name is Dulce and I am, I, and I am from Canberra. Has anyone ever heard of Canberra before? Okay, so tell me some of the things that you know about CAMBA. HIV case management. Yes, we do have that program. Project Ally accepts gay, bisexual, transgender youth. Yes, they do. They definitely cater to the queer community, absolutely. The food pantry. The food pantry, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we do have that too. What else? Who else has heard of CAMBA? Because I saw a few hands go up. What do you know so far about CAMBA? And I know Ms. Goldsmith said a few things. What do you know about CAMBA? We have a domestic violence program. Uh-huh, we do. Program we women. do. We do. Well, our shelter is for women and men and families. Yes, so we do. We cater to the homeless community. Yes. Anything else? Oh, and we do have the domestic violence prevention program, which is where I work under. <laughs> yes. We do, we do have summer youth. We have the summer camp. So now they're doing applications now for summer camp. So yes, and they do in like in-state, in-house camp and they also do outside. So if the students wanna go away, they'll do that too. So yes, they're doing the applications now. Just 
putting throwing that out there they're doing them now because <laughs> it's always it's always the same thing like people would come in June right before school ends and just like oh yes I would assign my child up for summer camp and we're just like well join our waiting list <laughs> so yes and I do have some gear for you all so please take so I don't have to go back with them okay <laughs> um, so Canva is a nonprofit agency that provides services that connect people with opportunity to enhance their quality of life. So we have these specific focus areas and within those uh, program, they have sub programs. So we have the economic development where they help with small businesses, they do financial planning, and it's open to everyone. They do the education and youth, so summer programs would go under there too. We have the beacon, the after school. They have the family support, which is where domestic violence, the violence prevention program would go under. So we don't only help with domestic violence, we also do any, um, we also help victims of any type of crime. So if it's murder, robbery, we'll help them file a compensation form and we'll help them with case management and everything under that sort. And that's, we also have health where the HIV prevention program comes in. They do housing where we all were talking about the shelter, the legal service where they'll help with immigration, um, eviction prevention. They have like so many things available. All right, we have like what, 108 programs I think that's for. I could be wrong, but I know it's above 100, <laughs> okay? And they all would fit under one of these key categories, all right? So I didn't even know how big Canva was until I started working for Canva. So yes, and we have like, and everything is completely free. And I think that's the misconception where people would think that they have to charge, like we charge for certain services, but no, it's free to the community. And if someone doesn't live in the community, that doesn't mean we'll turn them away and say, well, I'm sorry, you're from the Bronx and we're not gonna help you. Of course not, we'll still provide services to that person or probably send them a referral to somewhere else that might be closer for them if they prefer. And sometimes someone might want to come to Canva uh, on purpose, even though they live outside of the borough, just because, let's say, for safety concerns, if it is a victim of domestic violence, they might rather go a little further, so it's harder for that abuser to know where they are. So that can also be a thing, too. So we don't turn anyone away just because they don't live in a specific area code. And I think some people think that, that we will do that. Um, so within the violence prevention and intervention program, like I said, I work under that program. They also have the um, education part within that program. So has anyone ever heard of Enough is Enough? Yes, no, maybe so, somewhat. So what do you know so far about Enough is, enough is Enough? And I know I have like the definition here, but what do you know so far? What have you heard about it? Or Article 129B, Educational Article 129B. Anything? You're not sure? Y'all are just reading. <laughs> okay, so I'll I'll do the reading too. So educational law article educational law article 129b, also known as enough is enough, legislation requires all colleges and university in New York State. So I'm not sure about other states, but in New York State, they have to adopt a set of comprehensive procedures and guidelines to respond and prevent sexual assault, domestic and dating violence, and stalking. This includes that they have to have a uniform definition of affirmative consent, a statewide amnesty policy, and expanded access to law enforcement to ensure the safety of all students. So this was signed into law by Andrew Crumo. Do y'all know who that person is? Yes, okay, listen, I'm just making sure because I've been to places and they're just like, when did this come about? And I'm like, really? Andrew Krumo signed this to law and they were just like, who? And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so our governor signed this into law in July, 2005, in, in July of 2015. And this was happening because a lot of students were saying that they were reporting things of they were, they were reporting sexual experiences that they were having on campus that was unwanted, and they were telling the campus administrators about it, but nothing was being done. It was being like swept under the rug, or they were saying, okay, we'll take care of it in-house, but it wasn't being taken care of. So students didn't feel like they were being supported. And this is why this came about. I know a lot of people usually say, well, is this, does this deal with the thing that happened in Colombia? So I don't know, have you ever heard of this, the, well, they call her the mattress girl, but um, 
Have you heard about that story? Yes, the young lady. Yeah, she did. But I don't think it was a professor that was harassing her. I think it was another student that did it. Yes. And then she was an art major. for So for her art piece, she decided to carry around a mattress around to raise awareness. And of course, when someone's carrying around a mattress around campus, you're just like, what is this? Go like, what's happening? And she was letting people know, you know, I've been assaulted on campus. I think she was actually raped on campus and nothing was being done. And I still see the student in class with me. So there were a lot of things behind that, a lot of investigation behind that, but she's just one of numerous students that were saying, I am reporting, I am doing what I have to do, I'm saying something, and they're telling me, you know what, you're, you're taking this too seriously, or it's not that serious, you weren't raped or anything, or this is how this professor is. That's how he's just extra friendly with everyone. And no, no one should have to go to school and feel a certain, and, feel, and not feel comfortable in a learning environment. And this goes for work too. No one should have to go to work and not feel comfortable in their work environment. So this came about because of it. And there are certain guidelines that New York State schools have to follow. So some of the things that are required is that schools have to have a uniform definition of affirmative consent. And affirmative consent, they define it as an unknowing, voluntary, and mutual decision among all participants to engage in sexual activity. Schools also have to have an amnesty policy too. Some students were just like, you know, how about if I was drinking and there was alcohol involved and I'm not? a certain age, am I gonna get in trouble for reporting? And we want students to report. We don't want them to feel like just because they broke one rule doesn't mean that they're not gonna, they're gonna get in trouble for being sexually assaulted. So they wanna make sure that the school has an amnesty policy to ensure that students reporting incidents of sexual assault or other sexual violence are, gran are granted immunity. All right, so they won't, be in tr they won't get in trouble and I think students still feel like they will, um, but no, they won't. Their schools also have to give students a student bill of rights so students can know what their bill of rights are because they do have rights. Um, then this is where I come in, the comprehensive training, all right? So they want to make sure everyone is trained on topics like this. And I'll tell you this, I have done workshops with adults that are not sure what consent really means. And they're not sure what sexual assault really means. Because if you never have this conversation, something that you're doing, especially when culture plays, in part, plays a part of it, you're not sure, hey, because I'm always touching her on her hand, she feels uncomfortable, she feels violated. I thought I was just you know, telling her hello. But it's an icky situation. So we're making sure that we provide these trainings to staff on um, we're doing onboarding student orientation. We're doing it with students. We're doing it with the whole campus community, all right? And then the reporting requirements, we want to make sure that the students, well, the school is reporting. So they're doing auditing on the school's campuses. Um, I think there was an audit that had just passed before, and I think there's another one coming up. And this time, they're going to ask students, hey, are you getting the proper information? Some students are telling me, you know, I don't even know who to go to if I need to report. Some staff are saying, I don't even know who to go to if I need to report. So we're making sure that we're being that connection or that liaison to make sure that, hey, these things are available. These things are here for you. All right, so that's a little bit about enough is enough. I don't want to concentrate only on enough is enough. And if you have any more question about this law, you could definitely ask me after, okay? All right, so we're gonna move on. <laughs> so like, so today we're talking about gender interpersonal violence, okay? Recognizing and addressing problematic behaviors. All right? So let's start off with sexual harassment. What is it? So I know sometimes when you're in the workplace, they give you that sexual harassment training when you're first coming on board, yes? Mm -hmm. Right? I hope you all had that training. <laughs> Okay, so what is it? What is sexual harassment? I should see everyone like part like knowing it at the back of their minds. What is it? Or how would you define it to me? So if I didn't know what it was, how would you tell me? How would you explain it? Yes. Uh, it, it's something unwanted, and it's, uh, it, it, it takes place in the workplace. It's unwanted. It could be um, to create a, um, an environment where somebody feels uh, that uh, because they're at work, uh, a supervisor or somebody with some kind of authority is uh, uh, either asking them that. It doesn't have to be assault. It could be, you know, repeated requests or uh, social 
uh, interaction that the other person doesn't want. Okay, or so it could be discussing some sexual things in the workplace. Okay, so I heard a lot of unwanted. I heard that was like a key thing you kept saying was that unwanted activity or behavior, right? What else would it be? Mm -hmm. It could also be um, you're sitting in an office and uh, the group is speaking mm -hmm. sexual, sexual contest, whatever, and you're not part of it, but you're sitting at your desk, you're hearing it and feeling uncomfortable. Okay, so that plays a part into it too, yes. Did anyone else want to add? Obscene remarks. Okay. Yes, that goes. That goes with it too. So we'll define it. Well, I should say the EEOC defined it as unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal, nonverbal, or physical conduct of a sexual nature on and off the workplace or school site. So it doesn't necessarily have to be on on campus or in the workplace. It can also be outside. So let's say if me and Mrs. Moore, Mrs. Goldsmith goes out, right? We're friends. I mean, you befriend the people you work with because you're with them like 40 hours a week or even more sometimes. So we decided to go out after work for drinks. Is that sexual harassment? No, it's okay. I'm not going to say, oh boy, you were horrible for going out for drinks. And we decide to go out for drinks, right? And while we're there, we bump into someone else from SUNY Downstate. Is that sexual harassment? Absolutely not. Because I think sometimes people are just like, well, I can't even say anything. Or I can't do anything anymore. We're just like, no, that's not what we're saying. But you got to be mindful of the things you say. So let's say we went out, we had a great time, and tomorrow we come back to the workplace and we're talking about it. And we're just like, yes, you remember that guy that I saw? Mm. I went home with him that night and it was amazing. And we were doing this and we were doing that. We were doing this. And we're in the bathroom talking and someone happens to come in and they hear that conversation, a little bit about what you were saying. So what... What happened there? What, what's going on there? I should say. I don't want to give it away, but what's going on there? Because I didn't do anything wrong. I met up with my friend after work. We just, she asked me, you know, she left early. She asked me what happened after. I told her I went home with the guy that I met, and, that, and we had a really good time. It wasn't my fault that you decided to come in and walk into the bathroom while I was talking to her. Yes, there's always a right there's always a right place and a right time for certain discussions. You've got to be very aware of the things that you talk about in the workplace. But this definition that we read, right, there's a lot going on. What does this mean? Because let's say if I wasn't sure, it says unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal, nonverbal, or physical conduct of a sexual nature on and off the workplace slash school site. Yes. <laughs> What would that mean? Like, a, let's see if I didn't know. What is going on here? We're not sure? Okay, so I'll give you another hint. There's two types of sexual assault. There's two types. What are the two types? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Those are examples of sexual harassment, but the two types are, okay, I'll give an example. Um, let's say she's my boss. I'm just gonna keep using you as my, <laughs> and this is my boss, right? And then she tells me, Josie, if you really want that raise, you have to go on a date with me, or you know what? If you do this for me, I'll do this for you, or I'll put in a good word for you. What type of harassment? That is sexual harassment, but what type of harassment would that be called, huh? Blackmail? Yes, they could be a blackmail. What was it? Quid pro quo. Yes, quid pro quo. Have you ever heard of quid pro quo? Oh, man. <laughs> well, for those <laughs> that did it, it's like this for that. Oh. You do this for me, and I'll do that for you. You scratch my back, and I'll scratch your back. So it's like sexual advances. Some, sometimes they usually say it's from a higher up to another employee where they say, you know what, I'm using my power to take advantage. So you do this for me and I'll do that for you. You scratch my back and I'll make sure I, I scratch yours. So that's one type of sexual harassment. What's the next one? 
So we have quid pro quo. And hey, what's the next one? <laughs> Another example. Um, well, the first one, let's say if, you know, I'm talking to my friend, we're in the workplace, and we're talking about my sexual advance, my sexual life, and you all are, you know, around, but we're the one talking about it. I'm not including you. You were minding your business, and you were in my business while we're talking about it. What type of environment is that? What was it? It is. <laughs> Don't doubt yourself. It's a hostile work environment. Or every day I'm coming into the office and I'm hearing, mm, mm, yes. You're creating that hostile work environment where I'm not even feeling comfortable to come to work because of the things that you are doing. You're making me feel uncomfortable in my workplace. So those are the two types, quid pro quo in the hostile work environment. All right, we got that. Any questions so far? We're good? All right, so then what's sexual assault? I did a workshop on sexual assault, so for the people that were here, who remembers? <laughs> uh, this is where the test comes in. Or even for those that weren't right here, what is sexual assault? It's been on the news now, like it's really, sh there's been light shining on this topic. April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month for those that didn't know that. That's why we have the teal bags. <laughs> so what is sexual assault? How would you define it? What is this Me Too movement? Okay, so someone pushing themselves. Is it only when the person pushing themselves? Like, do you mean physically pushing themselves on you? Okay. What else? How would you define it, though? Um, I don't know the whole definition. Uh huh. But I want to say a physical act without consent. Okay, so that's a big thing. Consent, it's not there. Uh huh. So sometimes it could be physical, absolutely. But we'll define it as it refers to taking power and control of any sexual activity where consent is not obtained, active, or freely given. So you were right, there was no consent in that. But people think it's all based on sexual desire. Is it about sexual desire? Like someone's not able to resist because they have like so much sexual tension built up. Is it based on that? Absolutely not. It has nothing to do with the person's sexual needs. It's all about power and control, where I don't really care if I'm making you uncomfortable. I'm still going to do it. If I want to rub up against you, I'm going to still do it. I don't really care if you don't like it. I like it. That's all that matters. So it's all about this power and control. All right? So what are the different, so I'll ask you this. With sexual assault and sexual harassment, which is which? Like, which would fall under what? Or the different examples. Okay, you know what? Let me switch it. What are the different types of examples of sexual assault? Rape. That's a huge one. Everyone usually thinks rape. Yes. What is rape? Okay, yes. <laughs> Unwanted sex. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Yes, I don't even have to add to that. It's unwanted. There's no consent there. Yes. And remember, it doesn't always have to be forceful. I think that's another thing that we think rape is a forceful action, and it's not. If you're coercing the person, if you're forcing the person, if you are guilting the person or manipulating that person to giving you consent, it's still rape, all right? Because that's not a valid consent. You had to trick them or blackmail them or intimidate them to giving you that consent, and it's not valid. So that would still be rape. It doesn't have to be a forceful me pushing you down and beating you up to get, to get it. No, it's me manipulating you. Yeah. Yes, you may. Go ahead. So husband and wife, boyfriend and girlfriend, whomever. Mm -hmm. They're in the bed. One pushes up on the other. And one, the other one says, no, not tonight. Mm -hmm. And then after a little while of pushing up, the other gives in. And they... they Whatever. Mm. You consider that sexual assault? Do you consider that sexual assault? Yes. I say yes, uh huh. It is legally possible. Uh huh. But they're husband and wife. It is. It really is. Uh huh. I heard of other things too. They said they're husband. 
you consented to respond, but uh, even the fact your husband and you say no, and you still continue to say it's not consensual. Okay. So, repeat the last part. I would say it would be assault. Oh, it would be. Right. Yeah. No. Well, in the end, I cave in. Because you said they kept pushing up on me and pushing up on me. So I was like, oh, come on, let's just do it. <laughs> it could be a power control issue. Mm -hmm. It could be a what? Power. The person has power over you at that time. So you don't have a choice but say, well, I give in. So you give in. OK. I, I remember I gave this example about my, my boyfriend, my boo thing, my man, right? Because sometimes we usually think it's a male doing it to a female. But now let's say if I did have a partner and he comes in, I'm making sure I'm gendering it. So he comes home and he's really tired and, um, and I made sure, before he got here, I was just like, for me, I was really ready. I was in the mood, so I set the tone. I had all of this laid out and everything. And I even had, you know, a great lingerie on. So when he comes home, he already know what's going down. But when he comes, he seems a little upset. He's just like, Ducey, I had such a bad day at work today. And he, you know, he's just not in the mood. And I'm like, well, come on. And he's just like, I'm not really in the mood, Ducey. And then I blow up. I'm calling him, I'm like, you know, you are, what are you, are you gay? You don't wanna have sex with me? What is going on? Like, you know, I'm just like, are you cheating on me? The fact that you're not having sex with me? What's happening here? Like, why are you not, you, come on. Like, are, really? And I'm like getting mad at him, right? I even say, you know what? You can't even have any of my food if you're not doing what I want. And then he ends up caving in. He's like, fine, fine, fine. I'm not sleeping with you. And I'm, come on, come on. In that instance, did I rape my, my man yeah. or my partner? Yeah. I did. Mm -hmm. That's actual, that's rape. Because did the person want it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. And I still forced them into doing it with me. I told them, you know what? I threatened, what did I do, I should say? What are the things that, what were the tools that I used to get my way? You can't have my food. You can't have my food. <laughs> I definitely did. I mean, if he's not having sex with me, he must be <laughs> cheating. He has to be getting it from somewhere else, right? Because we think men always, man are always supposed to want it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, no, I definitely, I questioned his manhood. Mm -hmm. So I did, I knew exactly what I had to do just to get my way, just to get that control. At that moment, who had the power? Mm -hmm. I did. And I knew what to do to get it. So I definitely raped him. Like we said, it doesn't have to be a forceful action. If you're coercing the person or forcing them or manipulating them, or like you said, like keep pushing and pushing and pushing until the person's like, fine, fine. It's still rape, all right? So I think we sometimes people are not too sure where consent really lies. Listen, if you have to force someone to doing something that you want, they didn't really want to do it, okay? So when we're talking about the types, right? The types of when we talk about sexual assault versus sexual harassment. What do you see here? So some of the types of sexual assault, we said rape, unwanted touch, unwanted gestures, unwanted comments, the fondling, molestation, cat calls. And then we, when we look at sexual harassment, sexual comments, teasing or jokes, unwanted gestures, um, sexual innuendos and offensive comments. And then we have the cat calls too. I'm just gonna jump right back. So what's the difference? Uh huh. And the other one is just maybe verbal. verbal. Okay. Because I mean, I make um, sexual comments. I'm talking. I'm not touching you. Okay. And gestures. I'm doing whatever. I'm still not touching you. Okay. But what if it comes to rape, I actually had to touch you. Okay. And one is really a power dynamic in terms of physical power dynamic, and the other one is a gradual breaking you down and sort of wearing down your your humanity. Okay. I need to work on my examples then. <laughs> but yes, I like that one. Yes. Okay. What other, do, do you, do you think there's a difference? No. No. It, there really isn't. No. However, some people would say there is. Um, besides what you all pointed out, because some people were just like, well, isn't sexual harassment a form of sexual assault? Is it? 
Yes, no, maybe so, we're not sure. Okay, or is it sexual assault, a form of sexual harassment? <laughs> Listen, I am puzzled. <laughs> I am puzzled with this every day. People are just like, well, is sexual assault a form of sexual harassment or is it sexual harassment a form of sexual assault? I don't know. <laughs> I change my mind every day. Sometimes I'm just like, you know what? It is sexual harassment. That's a form of sexual assault. Sometimes I'm just like, no, it's sexual assault. That's a form of sexual harassment. Um, I'm not sure. I would say, some, like, I think I'm more on the fence of sexual harassment being a form of sexual assault because when we talk about child sexual abuse, that really wouldn't be a form of sexual harassment. So when you were talking about um, like the power dynamics, or when we talk about incest, because people can be sexually assaulted by their family members, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. but sexual incest wouldn't really be a, or would incest be a form of sexual harassment? Okay, so like I said, I'm not really sure. Some people would say yes, some people would say no. Um, for me, one is a form of the other, and we'll keep it like that. <laughs> and you all could choose whichever one, because I'm still on the fence about it. What does sexual harassment lead to sexual assault? That. it starts with talking. Okay. That's usually how a child is manipulated. They, they talk, sweet talk, and teach them, you know. Why would a mm -hmm. child sexual abuse be on that side, too? It could be. So remember, these are just examples. Mm -hmm. So it could be too. Maybe child's, I didn't even look at it that way. So like I said, people are always going back and forth. Is sexual harassment a form of sexual assault or is it sexual assault a form of sexual harassment? I say it could be either or. Because <laughs> the person, uh, my employer, my, yeah, my, my um, supervisor can rate me and that is a form of sexual harassment, I mean sexual assault, but it's also a form of sexual harassment because it happened in the workplace and it created a hostile environment and then it was and they did it because they told me that if I didn't I wouldn't get that promotion so it is a quid pro quo environment too so yeah it could be so like I said I'm not even sure which is which which form would be the other one all right but let's look at the forms of sexual harassment let's really talk about them um, what does it mean like when they say sexual innuendos and offensive comments what does that look like for someone who used to call women uh, hey girl and that was he was told by the women that they did not like that and he continued to do it so I would say that although it looks innocuous it's offensive because it's uh, juvenilizing somebody right absolutely yeah. yes it fall under that category. you're absolutely right and a lot of people are just like, well, how? That's a good one. I remember when I was doing this workshop, a male staff member told me he was writing an email and I think he told the, I don't remember exactly what he said, but he used the, the term girl to refer to one of the other academic professors. And he said, when she responded, she was upset. And I'm like, really? Why? <laughs> he was like, I don't know. So, <laughs> like you were saying, yes, calling a grown woman girl is extremely demeaning. So that's a form of sexual harassment. It is a demeaning word. Or even if you're talking about a grown man, would, you wouldn't refer to a, a grown man as, hey, boy. And sometimes, depending on the ethnic background of that person, it could also be a little racial, too calling a, a grown man boy. So yes, that is a form of sexual harassment. What else? How else does it look like? When we talk about sexual harassment or teasing and jokes, um, unwanted graphics, pics, what does these things look like? Can we go back to the girl part? Yeah. Sure. I'm really so awesome. I'm you know, you know why? Because mm -hmm. and just social greetings, and you know, we had a problem a long time ago about the N word. Okay. You know, people calling each other N word, and, and you can't say it because it has a lot of meaning, mm -hmm. a different meaning. If a certain person says it to a certain person, 
Now with girl, I'll come in the building, and I'll be behind two women, and the other one will call the other one, hey girl, <laughs> you know, is that, and if I was to say, hey girl, am I saying it in a demeaning way? I'll ask you all. That's the question I had too. Okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get offended by that. Okay. I guess it's in the eye of the beholder. Just something that may be offensive to someone may not be offensive to the other. So it's how you feel when you receive a comment. The and relationship you may say, be different. Mm -hmm. Right, you say that's offensive. I think that should be enough. Correct. Mm -hmm. I don't know, did you ever hear uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates said, uh, you know, I get to call my wife honey, right? Because she's my wife. But uh, that doesn't mean and everybody could call her honey and that would be okay, right? <laughs> and when they argue, you should keep all these things. <laughs> <laughs> that was my question. I just okay. to know about the Hey, girl. Okay. All because, right. Like she said, I guess it depends on, like, in the eye of the beholder. I wouldn't say that to... Miss Goldsmith, she's my boss. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that to her, but if I saw Edna, I may be like, "Hey, girl, what's up?" You know. So I guess it all depends on how you use it. Mm, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. I had another example where um, there was a in a certain school there was a professor that kept referring to the the women in his class as girls, and he didn't see anything wrong with it. So I asked you, is, is there something wrong with it? He was just calling them girls because they're women. So it's the same thing, right? Is it? I'm, that's, what I, that's what he told me. He said it's the same thing. Even at the college level, it should be women. It shouldn't be girls. Absolutely. It's just to be on the safe side. A girl is a child. If I am a grown woman, don't refer to me as a girl, mm -hmm. especially in the workplace, okay? However, like you said, if, if it's my sister and I, and I'm like, hey girl, let me tell you what happened. Sure, if they're okay with it, then that's fine. If they're just like, yes. But I think there's, there's still a fine line, all right? So we wouldn't want, just the same way, we, do we, how often are we to refer to grown men as boys? Not often. Even when grown men are referring to each other, I, I would hear, hey, bro, mm -hmm. but I never hear, hey, boy. Mm -hmm. But then again, when it's females, we're so quick to call them girls. No, she's a grown woman. Mm -hmm. All right. But what else? What else would be a form of sexual harassment in the workplace or just sexual harassment, period? When we really think about it. If someone's you well, not let's talk about non gesture, non gesture. I mean, nonverbal. So gestures. What would a gesture be? What do you mean? What do you mean? I was thinking if you have you're passing by and someone sticks their tongue at you, especially if it's a male and he's sticking his tongue at you, or something to that effect. Okay, so I hear sticking the tongue, a wink. Okay. What do you mean? You look good, or you know, like, but not stay, actually saying it, but mm -hmm. you know, the face is okay. Different. Okay, back to what you were saying about the way they dress. What do you mean? <laughs> Am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> Okay, so would that be a sexual harassment if I'm wearing something see-through? If it's in the workplace? Yeah, maybe. if I'm wearing it and it's... But if it, someone maybe comments on it, okay. on what you have on. Mm -hmm. So if it's something see-through and someone comments on it, you may, well, you will take offense to it. Okay, you shouldn't be commenting on it, period. 
there's, of course, there is inappropriate attire for work. And if, you know, your supervisor calls you in and says, um, you know, hey, your attire is not um, conducive to our work environment, depending. If the supervisor allows to say that to me, if the environment of itself doesn't have a work address code. That's another thing. What's the dress code in our right. work so environment? If you don't have a dress code. How are you going to tell me? To me, it looks fine. Well, who are you to tell me it's not if you don't have a dress code? That's 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 a very key thing, which we'll talk about. Yes, I saw your Last hand. Last week, there was a young lady in high school, and the administration asked her to wear a bra because she was showing her nipples and it was causing disruption in the classroom. So, she, so, okay, what? What happened? <laughs> well, actually, they organized, they're organizing yeah. women to go without bra. I think so somebody can tell us if that's the way or not. Yes! Well, we're back from 60. <laughs> 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 so now, so, yes, if I do wear a shirt with no bra because I am, I'm like, you? why can I not, why do I have to be, you know, all sucked up? I want to feel liberated. Mm. I want to let it hang. <laughs> Why? And then. It would be too nice for me. <laughs> <laughs> so now, where do we? Where would that happen? So let's say if people are talking about my attire, and they're saying it's making them feel uncomfortable because my nipples are showing, and oh my gosh, uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> so where would we go from here? Well, I guess you don't have a problem. <laughs> formal attire to say, well, I could go braless, but at least wear a jacket or a grill or something to that effect, or there's something dark. So if you don't have anything, and this is what makes me free and feel liberated, who are you to tell me what to do? So is there something wrong with, so, okay, we'll use you again. Tahisha <laughs> <laughs> comes to work, nipples all over the place. This is nipple, nipple, nipple. <laughs> is there something wrong with her saying, put on a sweater, put on a jacket? I don't think that, me personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But, right, Miss, she may, Miss Hurley may feel a way because I'm walking around the office and all you see is nipples. But where Miss Goldsmith may say, you need to put on a jacket or a sweater. And I don't. And I still don't. Mm -hmm. So what does that say? Oh, we'd be protesting, wouldn't we? <laughs> we would be like. She says to put on a jacket. Does that mean I have to put on a jacket? Or are you You're being instructed in the workplace? Yeah. Yeah. Right. But, but, but the idea oh. of what's inappropriate is very subjective. Yeah. And in the office, if somebody has what they feel makes them beautiful, and they come in, and they're in an the office, and other people are dressing plain Jane, then that person just stands out for their stock. Now the harassment comes in if that boss says, you're playing games, you can take a hike and take a, take a lunch break, but keeps this fashionable around and decides, I'm gonna throw comments at her. That's the harassment. Absolutely. And they create ways for others to start harassing that person too. I wish we lived in a world where Females can feel liberated without having to wear a bra and just go to work without people having to think sexually because they wore it. Mm -hmm. But we don't. <laughs> and that sucks. Where I guess in order to eliminate something like that, you would need to put in place a kind of a semi-formal type way to go to work. You know, yeah. not to come in with a see-through. And from the time I start the job, I know this is what I have to do. It's not that I walk in, you don't have anything, and all of a sudden you're telling me there's a workplace dress code that it was never there. That's another thing, to put a dress code after, after I started. I start. so but at least by the time I come in, I know this is what it is. Mm -hmm. So if I know that I'm not supposed to come in dressed like this, and then I still come that way, then you could say, well, you have a right to tell me something because I knew ahead of time, but you don't have no code any place. Who are you to tell me what to wear? This is what makes me feel comfortable. Yeah. I so guess you others would have to close your eyes. <laughs> Only if we lived in a world where people can just <laughs> it would be amazing. I'm still doing mine. 
It would be amazing, yeah. right? Yeah. Where, imagine if someone can walk outside and not have to feel the, get that unwanted attention, those cat calls. Mm -hmm. But it's sad. Like we we are talking about it. We are raising awareness. But there's so much more work to be done. So much more work. So. It's getting, I'll say, okay, I agree because it's bringing about change yes. somewhat. Yes. Some people, <laughs> you know, people have been twice before. They say certain things. Absolutely. But when we were coming back to this, yes, so those winking, winking would be on a, a form of sexual harassment or licking your lips every time I walk by would definitely be a form of sexual harassment too. All right, so those are different types. I'm just gonna quickly move on because I know. I okay, so when we're talking about gender based um, harassment, I love the definition that CUNY used. It says gender based harassment is unwelcome conduct of a non sexual nature based on actual or perceived sex, including conduct based on gender identity, gender expression, and non conformity with gender stereotypes that is sufficiently serious to adversely affect your ability to participate <coughs> in or benefit from any educational activity. Well, in educational program what does that mean I have no idea please explain the heck <laughs> all I see is words <laughs> how would you explain this to me or just explaining gender-based harassment what is that what's gender <laughs> Okay, or a man, what was it, a man that, that perceives himself as a female, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just asking, I'm mean, just asking. But you have so much now. <laughs> You're, and I think that you're not, I'm not even trying to use you as an example, but I think people get really scared to talk about gender and they're just so scared of getting it wrong or so scared of even talking about it that because you're not talking about it, it you end up offending others because you're not sure. So how many places have I been where you hear, are you a man or are you a woman? I'm glad you wouldn't, <laughs> but people do. <laughs> and all in all, does it really matter? What, why ask this? What does that have to do with getting this work done? What really, what, what I am, does that have anything to do with getting these reports done or teaching this class? What does that have to do with it? Nothing, absolutely nothing. And I think that's our problem because we think that there's only two genders out there, man and woman, and we just need to know where someone fits. Like, are you a man or are you a woman? Which one are you? Like, I need to know. So what are types of, these are some um, gender-based harassments. So intentionally using the wrong pronoun to identify a trans person. So trans, what is trans? Does anyone, or transgender, does anyone know what that means? So, usually when a baby is born, what is the first thing the doctor usually says? It's a boy, it's a girl, right? And regardless if the person is 3, 13, or 30, or even 90, they'll come back and they're just like, well, actually, you got it wrong. And they'll, do these, they'll do, go through a whole transformation, right, to make sure that their outsides matches who they truly are on the inside, okay? Because we're so used to seeing someone and because they are perceived to look like a female, we're like, okay, because she is a female, this is how I have to act towards her. Or because he is perceived to look like a male, we're just like, because he is a male, this is how I have to act towards him. And that's not always the case. There are people that say, you know what, I don't like to be placed in a box and I'm just gender non-conforming. So I refuse to conform to these two types of gender that people think that there's out there. All right, so that person might be gender fluid where they feel like, you know what, some days I, I feel that I like 
certain things that would be considered feminine and some days I like certain things that would be considered masculine, right? Remember, gender is a social construct. These are things that were made up to make people into two boxes, to fit people into two boxes, all right? So using the wrong pronoun. So if someone says my pronoun or they, them, theirs, and we're just like, so, hey, sir, he, come, like, whatever, <laughs> keep referring to the person with the wrong pronoun, that's a form of gender-based harassment. Or if the person says, you know what, I am no longer Samuel, I am now Samantha, and you're just like, I know you as Samuel, so I'm gonna keep calling you Samuel anyways. That's a form of gender-based harassment. You're, you're literally, some people feel like that's their dead name, like this is not me, all right? And you're literally continually bringing it up, like, hey, Samuel, hey, Samuel, hey, Samuel, even though they specifically said, my name is Samantha, all right? Or mocking the person's appearance. They'd be like, those are girl clothes. Those are not boy clothes. These are for females. Or saying, you know what? You're going to hell for, do, for being like this. Even if you don't agree, that doesn't mean that you'll make someone else feel uncomfortable, all right? Or asking the person, well, what are you? <laughs> like, I don't know what you are, so what are you? That's horrible, that's a really bad question, okay? You can ask the person, hey, my name is Dulcie, what's your name, or how do you like to be referred as? That's totally fine, there's nothing wrong with that, yes? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. And it, it's, it's, it comes to a form where we're even trying to fix certain documentations because when it comes to financial aid, I remember I did this workshop with financial aid officers. They were just talking about their struggle having when someone is a trans person and sometimes their aid gets messed up because, they, they, because they're no longer Samantha. I mean, they're, lo they're no longer Sam. They're now Samantha. And how the SUNY system hasn't caught up yet. But like you said, change is happening. Or even thinking about how inclusive are our workplace to people that are gender nonconforming? Or how inclusive are we to the queer community? Do you all know what queer means? So queer is an umbrella term, right? They, it's a political correct term. I thought it was a wrong term. So that's my next point. How many of us have heard queer as an offensive term? Yes, because it is an offensive oh. term. <laughs> so even though it is the political correct term, it is still an offensive term to some people. Some people within that community feels, um, they feel like they've reclaimed that, well, I shouldn't say they feel like, they have reclaimed the word, and they're just like, refer to me as a queer person. But others are just like, mm-mm, that word has so much, kind of like, so much history, don't use that word to refer to me. So it's base by base. If the person says yes, you can call me a queer woman, then go ahead. But if the person did not give you permission, then don't use it. So even though it is the political correct term to refer to that community, some people still feel like it is still very offensive to them. But talking about it, it's an umbrella term. So if they're LGBTQIA, because it's a lot of letters, they can just say the queer community. You all got that? Any questions? We're good? I know I'm like, keep going. I'm Five minutes, all right. So remember, queer is an umbrella term to refer to the community. And another thing, asking the person, well, who's the man in the relationship? When it's two, uh, when it's the same sex relationship, I hear this all the time where they're asking, well, who's the man? Like, are you the man or is he the man or is she the man? Um, does that really matter? Does someone have to be the man in a relationship when it's a, Say, no, it doesn't. The person does not, it doesn't, it, why does that matter? It matters to people because we need to know who's the dominant one in that relationship. We need to know how to treat this person. What, what is their, who's the one with the authority? And because we give certain genders authority over the other one, when we talk about um, gender roles, where, when we talk about gender roles, right? Does everybody know about gender roles? Gender stereotypes? Gender stereotypes are characteristics that society places on a gender, just on a person based on their gender. So if the person is a man, society would say you have to be strong, you have to be the breadwinner, you have to be the dominant one. And if it's a woman, society say you have to be the weak one, the emotional one, the submissive one. Do we know about gender stereotypes? Yes, no, is this a new t concept for some people? Okay, just making sure, right? And because of this, 
it leads to gender-based violence because we're just like, well, I need to know what are you in order to know how to treat you. I need to know if you are the man, because if you are, then I know you are the one that's supposed to be the dominant one. And if you are the woman, I know you're supposed to be the submissive one. And these things, they're very detrimental to our environment, okay? If someone feels like, hey, I like to be a stay-at-home mom, I like to do this, that's fine, because it's something that they like, it's something that they want. But if you expect it from the person because of this is, you know, because of their gender, then that's where you're crossing the line. All right, and then when we're talking about affirmative consent, I did say I was gonna to touch base on it. Consent is a clear, unambiguous, voluntary agreement to engage in specific sexual activity. So just because I agree to doing one thing doesn't mean I agree to the other. So if I'm in a workplace, just because I agree for, you know, for us to hang out on Saturday, that doesn't mean I agree for you to cross the line and touch my stuff when I'm not at work. All right, and those things happen too. Just because I agreed for us to call each other, hey girl, that doesn't mean when I'm with some, when I'm in a professional setting with other people, you can refer to me as hey girl. It's, there's a different type of setting, all right? So when we talk about consent, we're not only talking about an intimate partner relationships, but consent among our coworkers too. Making sure that we have strict boundaries with our coworkers, letting them know what is okay and what is not. Because once those things are crossed, that's when it creates that hostile environment. You can let the person know, you know, I don't really, I don't think this conversation that you're having with this person is really appropriate for the workplace. You should, it's okay to let the person know because maybe I'm talking about this and I didn't know it was offending you. But once you, once you told me about it, if I do not change and I continuously do it, that's where we're getting into that, the things that we're talking about here today, okay? But when we're talking about intimate relationship, consent also has to be enthusiastic. It has to be willingly, like we were talking before. It has to be like a yes and not a fine, okay? But now I ask you these questions to just to think about. We were talking about policies and procedures, right? What, what is SUNY Downstate's policies and procedures? Do we really know what they are? Like, how am I supposed to know if I'm not creating that hostile environment, if I don't even know what my policies and procedures are? Or what are the resources available to staff, administrators, and students? If something like this is happening, if I'm being harassed every single day when I come into work, who do I talk to about it if it is my supervisor that's doing it? Maybe I don't feel comfortable going to HR because my supervisor is really friends with people in HR and so I don't feel comfortable. Where do I go? Where is, who's outside SUNY Downstate that I can go to? The EEOC is here, people, okay? <laughs> Just letting you know, throwing that out there. Or how can you help prevent sexual violence, harassment, and gender-based violence in the workplace, okay? Are you the one that's creating it? Are you part of the problem? Are you the gossiper? Are you the one that's just like, you, saw, you know what I saw on so-and-so's Facebook page when I was looking at it? Can you believe she posts this and this and this? And you hear this a lot where people's social media is coming into the workplace. Okay, I remember I worked for an organization. They were just like, we are not allowed to be friends on social media. They were just like, that is not okay because of things that happen. Then I've been in other places where they were just like, you know what, it's a more grassroots level and we were allowed to be friends with anyone that we wanted to. So it depends on that workplace. So it goes going back to what is the policy and procedures here, all right? And who are our support system? If I am reporting, how do I know that this person is not gonna retaliate? Like, or if this is happening to me, is there some place, somewhere, a safe space where I can go where I'm feeling supported? Do we have these things in place, okay? Or if I am, uh, if I'm, if I am gender non, if I'm, if I am a gender non-conforming person, right? Do I feel included in all the activities that are happening on campus? Is my voice being represented? Or is there even a bathroom for me to use? Okay, are these things set out? All right, any questions so far? We're all good? And boom, these are some of the resources that we have on campus. So who's the Title IX coordinator here? Yeah, the Title IX coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> this is something that you all should know, okay? Or, <laughs> or student affairs. Who is the student? Where is student affairs? Where do I go? Yes, and then the university police. Who, who are university? Where is that located? Okay, knowing the different resources that are on campus. But then if you don't, if you don't feel 
comfortable going to the ones on campus, there are also stuff outside. So these are rape crisis hospital hotlines, but also they do have other programming there. So I know Wyckoff specifically have the same type of program we have where it's enough is enough. So they do provide resources too, okay? And these are more. And then I did want to talk about Denim Day. So April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And on April 25th, it's Denim Day. And Denim Day started because a young, a young girl um, was taking driving courses and her driving instructor picked her up, told her to drive to a secluded location. And she did because she thought, you know, we're, he's probably teaching me where to park, how to drive with no cars. But instead, he told her to park and he raped her. And then after that, he told her, if you tell anyone, I will kill you. So he threatened her too. But what she did is when she got home, she told her parents about it and her parents supported her and they did press charges. So he did get arrested. However, he, his um, ruling was overturned. And he said, you know what? I didn't really rape her because she consented and they were just like what do you mean he said she had really tight jeans on so in order for us to have sex she had to take off her jeans because they were really tight so that means it was consensual yes and females in the parliament so this happened in italy females in the italian parliament was just like this is ridiculous are you serious so because someone has tight jeans on and they and you threaten them and they had to take it off that means that it was consensual so the next day in solidarity of victims of sexual assault they all had they all wore jeans and this came so la was the first place to adapt this and now different states within the united states and nation and um globally started doing denim day so on denim day people wear jeans to rep to be in solidarity of victims of sexual assault and in new york city they also have a rally that's happening on the 25th where we, they would walk across the brooklyn bridge to city hall and then there's like a huge thing there's a demonstration they have different politicians come survivors and people do like a huge rally so if you all are interested let me know too because i'll definitely be going um, but it's on april 25th so it would be really nice if people from suny downstate also wore jeans on that day in solidarity of sexual assault awareness month and for sexual assault survivors okay any questions we all good all right <laughs> that was it Okay, this is not me. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming out. I just want to remind you that next month on May 9th, same time at 2 p.m., we will have part two to our workshop series, which is about bystander awareness and intervention. So the question is, if you're in the room and you see or see something that says, how can you act, what can you do to perhaps prevent it from escalating, and how can you provide support to your coworkers, to students? So I hope to see you there next month, May 9th, okay? Thank you. Thank you. No problem.